our informational video consists of interviews from three professionals from Sacramento who use play therapy in their field of practice. In the interviews, we learn their personal definition of play therapy, why play therapy is important, which theory or theories they practice, how they set up their room, what ages they work with, the purpose of sound training play therapy, and specific questions pertaining to their practice. We also will demonstrate how to set up a playroom in your own home. We end our informational video with examples of what not to do and what to do when doing play therapy, specifically geared to child-centered play therapy. Well, I believe that play is how children communicate. And so play therapy is a way to use play to help children to be able to articulate their feelings, um, either acting them out or talking about them or drawing them. It's just a means to get kids comfortable so they can talk about whatever the issues going on in their lives. My definition of play therapy would be a form of therapy for children that doesn't require them to be verbal and allows them to use their own form of communication so that they can express themselves in the way that fits them best and allows them to express what they need, what they want, what's going on for them and help them process through their experiences. The definition I have for play therapy is it's a therapeutic orientation where it allows the child to explore, it allows the child to communicate through their play. So um, an example um, as a child is exploring, let's say they're playing with Legos mm -hmm. and the child is building and creating something. As, um, as their counselor and therapist, I reflect that they are creating something and that they are creating something all by themselves. And uh, through time, that child will gain a sense of responsibility that they are responsible for their creation, whatever it is. The reason I think play therapy is important is because children do process through the same experiences adults do but not in the same way. And so without play therapy, I don't really know how we can help children process through otherwise. And so I think it gives them a way in their own language, which is play, to be able to work through whatever problems they have. And so if um, you have a child that has um, something big going on in their life, like some sort of trauma or divorce or um, an adjustment to something, it's a way to be able to help them open up and um, communicate. And so play therapy is often kids' first opportunity coming into therapy. They, most little kids haven't been in therapy before. It's the first time you open the door and introduce them to the world of therapy. And I think it's really important that it's a good experience. So many parents that I talk to, they take people, kids to therapists that aren't trained to work with kids necessarily and expect them just to sit there and be lectured to and talked to and, and kind of interrogated. And kids don't want to go back to therapy. So I really welcome having kids come here as their first experience to make this a fun, enjoyable, meaningful experience for them so that it's not a scary thing should they need therapy in the future. So I believe play therapy is important because it allows the child to explore, it allows the child to become aware of certain feelings that, you know, that are inside and that need to come out uh, through us as a counselor and a therapist, reflecting uh, these feelings through their play. As a child is communicating through their play, um, I believe play therapy um, helps a child with their self-esteem, that they are able to realize that they are creating something, that they are making something, that they are uh, communicating through their play um, by reflecting what they're doing. And I just, that's why I think play therapy is so important. You know, um, I use what I call a prescriptive approach. Um, and this approach, if um, you've heard of Paris Goodyear Brown, really uses this approach a lot. And I really admire the work that she does in that I base the approach I'm using on the child that I'm working with. 
So often, if I have a child that needs a non-directive approach, that's the approach I'll use. If there's a trauma history or something like that, that I feel like that would be best suited to them. Oftentimes, it's a single incident thing that's going on, and so I might use a much more directive approach with kids to help them be able to get in here, talk about what's going on in a playful, fun way, using art and that sort of thing. Um, I specialize in grief and loss, and so often I'm using art to help kids making masks, um, puppets, and um, help to help them express their feelings. I would say my main uh, therapeutic orientation is play therapy. Um, I also use um, client-centered play therapy. Um, I use uh, Violet Oaklander's Gestalt therapy. Um, I use some Santre exercises. Um, Right now, I'm currently into the growth mindset, um, where um, the power of effort, um, getting the children to realize through their failures, um, through persistence, through perseverance, um, being resilient, um, that their mind can grow from it. I definitely use child-centered play therapy. I think that for me, I find that it works extremely well with all clients. I haven't yet had a client that didn't respond well to child-centered. Mm -hmm. I will say that there are times where I'll use different techniques within child-centered just for a specific situation. So when I have a child with ADHD, for example, he might need a different kind of intervention just to help. It's more like a modification, I think I would say, to help him be able to fully get what he needs out of the play therapy. But overarching, what I'm using is child-centered. I pay careful attention on how I set up a room uh, prior to bringing in the child. Um, I definitely make sure that there's a realistic setting available, a creative, an aggressive, and a nurturing area for the child when they are uh, going to do the play there. Because of the way the room is, it's not exactly ideal how I would do it in terms of separating some of the categories. So what I do is have transitional toys in between. And so I have the aggressive toys, which then lean into reality, which then go into nurturing, and then I go into the creative section. This end of the office down here where we're sitting now is a couch and a few chairs where I can sit with parents or families to talk and um, do that sort of thing when we're checking in or meeting. Most of my day is spent on the floor in here where I'm sitting on the floor with kids or have the parents down on the floor with the kids and we're playing. Um, over on at the clear other end of the office is the more play therapy set up. Um, there's a little whiteboard there for kids to draw on. Often kids come here with school issues so we're playing school kind of things. There's several, probably about a hundred puppets in there, over there somewhere, and all the uh, um, that we use um, with kids and families to do. I use them mainly to do family puppet shows in here. And then there's a large sand tray collection, and so there's three different sands, actually four different sands over there, and. Um, they, I let the child, for the most part, choose the sand they want. They have all different textures because I, one of the big things in working with kids is sensory integration issues, and so textures are very important to different kids for different reasons. So there's, um, you know, just your typical sand. There's more. There's a more coarse black sand. There's a real fine red sand over there, and then there's um, the magic sand stuff down there that clumps together, um, which a lot of real traditional sand tray therapists would cringe at, but it, little kids love it, so they call it moon sand, I think is the name of it. And then set around the whole room is all the sand tray miniatures, and they're all divided into category. I, all, I have two houses. You'll see there's a second dollhouse up on top over there, and that's because I work a lot with divorced children. So if you're working with the kids from divorce, do you need two homes, right? So they can act that out and show you what goes on in the two homes. There's up a, on top of the shelf over there, those are all therapeutic games. So all those games you'll see have to do, there's family games that I would sit and play with whole families together. There's the two home game for divorced kids. There's 
games that have to do with critical illness over there, the games that have to do with anger control, teaching social skills, looking, being able to tell if kids can read facial cues, those kind of things. So that's what all those games up on top there are all therapeutic games. But I actually use just regular games more than therapeutic games, but I give them a therapeutic twist. And so this um, cabinet right here is filled with just games you would buy at like Target, um, Toys R Us, that kind of thing. And, but there's also a shelf over there with all filled with children's books. Oftentimes, um, bibliotherapy can be a really neat thing in introducing children to topics they don't know much about or they feel alone in experiencing. So anyway, and um, I can show you more some other different things that I've done with kids. I, I generally work uh, with the K through five population. Three to ten. At this point in my practice, I think my youngest client is about three years old, and typically the kids that I'm working with in in this private practice setting are kids who are, have been adopted or have had some sort of trauma experience. I actually have a couple college students I'm working with right now, but these college students were kids I saw as youngsters, and they just, um, and that's very typical when you work with children, is you'll start off working with them especially when I do a lot of the grief and loss work. So I might work with a kid when mom's diagnosed with breast cancer and help them through that time. And then they don't need to come anymore and they'll go about their business. <laughs> and then uh, maybe there's a reoccurrence of the cancer or something else comes up so they come back. Or maybe mom passes away so I help them through the grief and loss thing. And so often I'll start to see kids at a young age and they and they just keep coming back. It's not like I see them continuously. And oftentimes um, the transition to college is really hard for a, a lot of kids and so they'll show up again here and mm -hmm. for the person that they know and trust and it's just an easier transition for them. So those, I'm not necessarily doing play therapy <laughs> with those kids. I'm doing more talk therapy, maybe some art therapy with them, but yeah. The sand tray is one of the most important tools in a playroom. There are some therapists who actually just do sand tray therapy, which is an element that takes play therapy and talk therapy and combines a little bit more. But as far as in the playroom, the sand tray itself is facilitative in many ways. And so for one way, children are very kinesthetic, and so they just like the feel of it, and they'll play with it, and it sometimes leads to expression in that sense. The other thing is children will bury things in the sand, which is always significant. We don't always know why it's significant, but if a child is burying things, there's something in there. Um, it could be a variety of different reasons. It could be as simple as that there's been a death and, and they might be grieving. There's also safety and security that could be part of it. It could also be that they have some aggression and don't want a certain like character, for example, to be seen, things like that. And so it's facilitative in terms of themes that way. And then also the sand can be used in so many other types of play. So I see children use it with They'll mix it with paint, and so then that has their creative play. They'll put it in like the tea cups, and now we have actual tea. So they, they use it in a lot of lot of different ways. Earlier you talked about their, I think you call it their play? Their play, yeah. Can you yeah. Um, describe that so we can get that? <laughs> I, could, I sure can. Um, I was trained at the Their Play Institute in Chicago. And TheraPlay started out as um, an approach working with kids in the Head Start program, actually, mm -hmm. years Please and help. years ago. And um, it was using, they were using it a lot back then, actually, with kids with autism to help those kids to be able to um, relate to others and going back and really working a lot on eye contact, that sort of thing with them. Um, but from now it's really being used with all kinds of kids and it's really, I, I see it as an attachment approach way to work with kids and parents. It's a um, very directive approach. It's about having the parent be in charge and um, be able to um, re bond with their child. And um, it starts off by using something called the Marshak Interaction Method, where you're doing an assessment of the parent and child relationship. 
and then meeting with the parent and discussing that and then coming up with the treatment plan and that's where it, it would involve using TheraPlay with the parent and child together. So all the sessions in TheraPlay are done with the parents in the room. Um, it's almost like little kid type games that you're playing with them. Um, and there's four different categories you're really looking at. Structure, of, or basically who's in charge here. Is that something you're working on? Challenge is um, like teaching. And so how is this child when the parent's trying to teach them something? Are they a kid who gives up easily? Are they a kid who lo loves a challenge? And so you can base your treatment plan on that. Then you're also looking at nurturance. How is the parent at nurturing the child? How is the child at receiving the nurturing from the parent? Mm -hmm. And then that fourth category that you're looking at is engagement. And that's just all about how is the parent at engaging this child to with the with them and how is the child at engaging with the parent often kids who you see on the spectrum for instance will be very hard to engage and so you'll start you'll pick up on that and you'll be working on that where other kids um, they're so just intent on being in charge that's all they care about so we'll be working more on that it just kind of matters what comes up in the assessment and then I base the activities on that What's your average case look like how many students do you see per day? Uh, I typically see about 10 students per day. 10 students per day. Um, I'll see, um, I'll have a group session per day, and then I'll see about four students individually per day. Mm -hmm. And then my caseload's about 20, around 20 right now, 20 students. Do you use a lot of um, limit setting? I do use a lot of limit setting. It is not always successful on the first try, so then I'll use ultimate limit setting. I would say I use limit setting with almost every client every session. There are some clients that don't use, they just don't need limit setting as much. They have a little bit more of an internal focus of being able to control their behavior. But most of my clients, the reason I'm seeing them is because that they do have that external focus. And so then it's the limit setting to help them gain that. Most of my clients, power and control tends to be a big theme. And so limit setting works really well for them because it gives them the choices that they still can feel that they have some power and control over the behavior. I would say for some of my children, the limit setting one time, you know, it's fine, it works for them. Some of them they will test a limit, they'll kind of look at me while they're going to test something, or some children will even flat out ask, can I do this? And you, you'll either respond, yes, that's something um, for playing with, or that's for doing here, or that's not for doing, and you set the limit. Um, but then there's other children who, even as you're setting the limit, they're going to continue to break the limit until the choice becomes that they don't get to play with the toy anymore. So for example, I had a child yesterday who was deciding to twirl scissors on other scissors, so very dangerous behavior um, and so that was one where I had to eventually the scissors were not for playing with anymore because he was having too much fun but I definitely limit set. I think actually I should say therapeutic limit setting in my opinion is one of the most important parts of play therapy not just for me when I'm working with the client in the session but also it's one of the tools I'm always teaching parents and guardians because usually again they're at their wits end they're not sure what to do anymore in terms of behaviors and so it gives them a skill they can use at home. According to Gary Landreth, an average playroom should be 12 feet by 15 feet. A dining room or smaller room could be the space to hold play therapy sessions at home. But remember, not just anyone can do play therapy. So now that you have picked the room and have moved all the furniture aside, it's time to set up your playroom. When setting up your toys, it is important to categorize your toys into four specific categories. Realistic toys, aggressive toys, creative toys, and nurturing toys. An important tip to remember is to have the aggressive toys and nurturing toys across and apart from one another. Now we will be showing you a dramatization of what not to do 
and what to do in a child-centered play therapy session. Hi, I'm Erica. Do you want to come play with me? Hi, I'm Erica. I'm your special play buddy and it's time for your special play time. This is the room where you can play with the toys however you want. This is a special playroom where you can play with many things in many different ways. You're bouncing the ball. You picked up the phone. You're moving those just how you want. You picked up the other one. You're moving that around. Oh, you're looking at that. You're concentrated. You're focused. You're moving around. You're, you're putting your fingers on that. Yep, you're, you're patting that. Yep, you're moving that back and forth. You're interested in those. You're bouncing that. You decided to play with that. Now you have that in your hand. Yeah, you're moving that around. Oh, you're excited about moving that. You're interested in those. Oh, you're you're playing with that. You're moving that just how you want. You're focused. I know you, I know you want to throw those around, but they're not for throwing, so just stop it. Just stop it. I know you're very excited, but the beans are not for throwing. You can choose to dig your fingers through them or pat them. Dig my fingers. Okay, you decided to dig your fingers. You go play your with yeah. You go play over there. And here you play by yourself. Do you want to play? Me? Show me what to do. That's it, around. Hi, I'm Erica, and it's time for your special play time. No, I said that wrong! Oh man, the fan trayer. <laughs> I don't know what his name is, the fan You decided to bounce the ball. You just labeled that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's recording? Okay, go ahead, go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 
me. So you're gonna hand, you're gonna hand the dog and say, do you wanna play with me? <laughs> you have to hand me the dog and say, do you want to play with me? Yeah. <laughs>